All right, why don't we, uh, why don't we get started? I'm very, very excited about this evening. My name is Dr. Bob Childs. Uh, I teach on the faculty here. And um, I've had the great pleasure of teaching uh, humanistic psychology and have tried to use a, a lot of Robbie Bosnak's uh, thinking and his work in my teaching. And I've known Robbie for at least 25 years now, maybe more, and uh, I'm very excited that he's actually here uh, with us and, and give us an opportunity both to get to know his work and uh, some of the evolution of his work. Um, Robbie is the author of four books uh, on psychotherapy, including his book on uh, embodied imagination called Embodiment. Uh, the Embodied Imagination in Culture, Art, and Travel. Something like that. Something like that. <laughs> Pretty close. Uh, and then he also uh, is an author of uh, his first book of fiction called Red Sulfur, which is out. And it's the first of a series, which I know he's hard at work at. So uh, I've read it. It's a really, really wonderful book. So uh, something to think about when you graduate, if you've graduated. <laughs> yes. Um, very distracting. Very distracting. So. Yeah. But we, tonight we're here to talk about uh, embodied imagination. And so what I'm kind of imagining for the program tonight is um, I'll spend a little time talking with Robbie about some of his, his work. And, and then uh, Robbie would love to invite one of you up here to work on a dream. And we have a, a microphone all set up for you. Uh, it'll be just a short dream. And we'll probably take 20 minutes to so half an hour, work on the dream, and then um, open it up to questions from the audience and to help you sort of try to integrate some of what you've observed with some of what you've uh, thought about in terms of how to work in this method. So uh, let's get started. Let's see. So let's think. Where to start, Robbie? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure. And it's wonderful to be back here in Boston. And I was walking around in Cambridge, and it's as if I've never been gone. And when I walked around in Boston, it was totally different. Yes, it's changed. Yeah. Cam Cambridge never changes. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's true. Um, so one of the things I was thinking, a great place to start, is uh, so much of clinical psychology, the focus in clinical psychology this day, and certainly uh, in terms of the program here at uh, William James College, is on uh, cognition, different cognitive therapies. And, um, but I know that uh, in terms of embodied imagination, there are elements of cognition in there. So I thought it might be a point of entry for you to sort of talk a little bit about the nature of the imagination and uh, sort of the nature of cognition within the imagination. Right. Um, uh, let me first say what I mean by the word image. Yeah, that's great. Because, let's start there. Uh, uh, embodiment is more or less clear. The word embodiment is overused. It's everybody's now doing everything embodied. Um, but the word imagination, I take um, the word image from dreaming. Dreaming I take as my paradigm for imagination. And um, so if you remember your last dream, you will find that it's not a story. It's a place. It's a place where you find yourself. And everywhere in the world, um, if you ask a person about dreams, and that's been my passion to go all over the world and ask people about dreams, um, they will tell you, I was somewhere, something happened, and then I woke up. So that is my definition of dreaming, because I'm a phenomenologist. And um, so a dream is a quasi-physical place where you find yourself. So I take my, because you wake up, so it's not a physical place, but it presents itself as physical. So I call it quasi-physical. And um, I, uh, I take that as my definition of the image. So um, in imagination, we try first to get a person back in the image. So if I work with somebody and they work on a memory, uh, embodied imagination, not just with dreams, it's with memories, with symptoms, with all kinds of different things, um, then um, I will not so much focus on the story, but I will say, now let's put it in the present tense. Where are you? And the person says, well, I'm in a room with two cameras and many people, um, and there is a guy talking and somebody else introducing him. And um, I will ask, what's the light like? And what are the sounds like? And how are you sitting in your chair? And so slowly to get the body back in the image. Now, that's all, it's an entirely cognitive process, right? Um, we, we have begun for some reason that is clear to all of us to equate cognition with rationality. But um, that's not necessarily true. It's, 
um, in perception, and um, I come very much from, uh, from phenomenology in Merleau-Ponty where he talks about the primacy of perception. The first thing that happens is that we perceive things, right? And in perception, there is already a lot of cognition. So I think that cognition is central to working with the imagination. Yeah, so in, in the embodied imagination, uh, uh, y your work then is to make the image as vivid as possible. Mm -hmm. And then um, as your work has evolved, you've sort of incorporated sort of the, the, I the intersections of imagination, affect, and then sen sensory body, right? right? And so could you speak a little bit about that, the sort of the layers of your work and, right. and sort of how you help yeah. uh, focus so much? Yeah. And, um, uh, I'm very interested in embodied states. And an uh, embodied state is not just emotion. Embodied states have affects, they have sensation, and primarily they happen in the body. Um, we now know from neuroscience that um, emotion is very much of an embodied state. And um, so uh, I am no longer so interested in what is psyche and what is body and that's why my whole interest became embodiment which is a fusion of the two and we don't try to take it apart. Um, so I think that um, as long as we can feel and sense what is going on we are in the body and that's how we enter into imagination through sensing, through feeling, um, through observing, through perception. Those are all the elements that we use and we use a lot of mind. We use a lot of um, how does that look and as you look at that, yeah, can you describe it? Can you describe? And so we use descriptions to get a person deeper and deeper into the imagination and as you go deeper into the imagination, your consciousness begins to shift. Yeah. To, um, to what we call the hypnagogic state. Yeah. And that's what I'm very interested in, the hypnagogic state. Yes. And, and sort of in the embodied imagination, your focus, I know you started out, uh, your original training was in, in Jungian psychology in yeah. Zurich. Um, no, my original training was in criminology. Oh, criminology, okay. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So it's a nice intersection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but in thinking about, um, the work that you're doing, the, the focus is not really uh, so much on ego development, no. right, as it is in terms of the valuing of the imagination and all the different states that are, maybe you could say are, are around the ego or which the ego is a part of. Yes. So I'm wondering if, if, you know, many of the people here maybe aren't familiar with that style of working, so maybe you could help us understand a little bit of what it might look like. Yeah. Um, uh, I, um, I think that um, w one of the main tasks that I feel that we have uh, in all of psychotherapy is to get a person outside of their what I call habitual consciousness. Because habitual consciousness are the ruts that you're in. It's the habits of consciousness. Everything is very redundant. Um, um, you, when you see something, you immediately put it into your habits of consciousness. So very few new things begin to happen. I actually find that if you stay very much in habitual consciousness, time speeds up. Because, um, and um, as I now am older, I like to time to slow down. <laughs> and um, so the more you move outside of your habitual consciousness into non-self states, um, the more original information comes in. And um, dreams are a fantastic opportunity for that because there are many different perspectives going on in a dream. If you uh, have a dream, which is my example that I always give, my habitual example to immediately um, <laughs> turn around what I'm saying, um, of somebody being chased by a dog, then you have in that dream, from the point of view of dreaming, you are being dreamed, so I am being chased by a dog, you, I am being dreamed because my, um, my physical body is lying in bed, and so I am being dreamed. So the notion of I have a dream is actually a problem. And um, the worst problem is in, in, in French, where the notion is uh, j'ai fait un rêve, and I made a dream. You don't make a dream, uh, the Japanese are a little better with it. They, they say, um, I saw a dream. 
Um, so the dream happens, and in the dream I am being dreamed, and also the dog is being dreamed. So if I work on the dream, I should not just work it from my perspective, but also from the perspective of the dog. And so much of the work is about how to get out of the perspective that I'm identified with and move to the non-identified perspective, like for instance the dog. But it's not just the dog. The houses around are being dreamed. Everything is being dreamed. Everything is in a state of animation. There are no things in dream. Everything is animated. And so you can get into any kind of position. But for that, I have to do a demonstration to show how that works. OK. Do you want to do that right now? Should we move into that? That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. So let me first do my song and dance about the dream. Um, the dream that I can work with here has to be short which means that it is brief, which means that it is not long. <laughs> so it is a short, brief, not long dream that uh, has been happening recently and um, that um, is still fresh. And by fresh, I mean that it still can be remembered as an event. So it's not something that you find in your dream book and you say, oh my god, who had that dream? That's a dream that I cannot work with in this way. So it has to be something that still partially is an event. So you don't have to remember the whole dream as an event, but part of the dream has to. So in, in, for instance, in the dream with the dog, if you remember that I am walking down the street and you remember that you're walking or you remember the way that the light is in the street, the, that's fresh enough to, to work. So a dream of the last week or so and um, that is brief, not long, and thus short, um, and that um, is still fresh. Who would be willing to present such a dream? And what I, let me first say, what I'll be doing is I'll be working entirely on the dream itself. I will try and stay out of all the very personal things that are involved with it because I, my, one of my tasks is to prevent a person from shaming themselves because we don't want that. But you can do a lot of work on a dream without anybody knowing what it is about personally. So we will be working entirely on the dream itself. Um, and I will protect you from the audience. So. Um, Anybody willing to? Yes, I see somebody in the back there. Yes, thank you. Could you please come here? So um, my thought to move quickly into the demonstration is there's a lot of, to imagine yourself into the therapist chair, I think it's great to see yourself. And I really invite you to, to really uh, imagine yourself into Robbie's experience. And then after the dream work happens, then we can really think together about what it means to practice from this method and try to understand it. I also want to say that uh, in working in this method, you don't necessarily need to work on dreams. And right. Robbie's going to talk about that. Yeah. But you, you can move from a narrative into image. Right. And so that's another important aspect of this. So it doesn't, your patients. And that is very important because there are many people that don't remember their dreams. And um, so as a therapist, you will, many times you will get a person who never dreams. And um, so then you can do this just as well with memories. Great. Thank you. Hi there. Hi. What's your first name? I'm Jessica. Jessica. Now, Jessica, this is being recorded, and um, you get to decide of this part what you want to do with the recording, OK? okay. If you don't want it to go anywhere, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, in this room, clinical rules apply. That means that what is in this room stays in this room, and therefore you have complete control over what is being recorded. So let me first tell you something about telling the dream, and then I will tell you about listening to a dream. Um, about telling a dream. So what you um, will help, what's your name? The, one more time. Jessica. Jessica, Jessica, Jessica. OK. <laughs> That's one of, the, one of the problems of being close to 70. That begins to <laughs> fly away. <laughs> um, so. Um, Jessica, what you do is you go back into your dream and you describe it as an event, as something that happened to you, right? Mm -hmm. Not right now, but as something that happened to you 
and so that you can take us with you into the dream so that we can experience the dream with you as an environment and that's mm -hmm. the best way for us to work with it okay. okay now we talk about listening to the dream um, uh, I go from the pr point of view that we know absolutely nothing about dreams nothing zero nothing any interpretation that you have about a dream when you hear a dream is most likely a resistance so you know nothing about a dream so the only thing that and so take a dream as if you hear a dream being told by somebody from a culture that you do not know at all you've never been to this country you don't know it so you don't know what it means and anything that comes up is probably your own way of your own culture and putting your own culture on the dream so get away from that so what do we have nothing so but what we do have is a body and um, so what I would like you to do is to note how your body is um, feels before you hear the dream I go from the perspective that as you hear the dream the dream will cause turbulence in the system and then you can maybe feel shifts and these shifts might have something to do with the dream we don't know everything is uncertain but it might so therefore you first have to spend about a minute to really feel what's going on in your body right now because that is your body before Jessica and then you will find your body on Jessica so um, take a moment to really move through your body sense what's going on what do you feel in your body where you feel it and what moods you're in because this is your baseline this is your attunement right now and we are going to be interested in shifts in attunement we can talk about that later you're going to hear the dream twice and um, after the first telling um, you um, uh, recollect for yourself what happened to you in the f uh, during the first telling and then that's an introverted listening the second time you listen in an extroverted way that is you really listen for the content so if you want to write things down don't write it down the first telling you get a chance in the second telling first telling just be with yourself um, so take a moment a minute to feel what you are feeling right now this is anyway a great thing to do before a patient comes in Jessica, you go into your dream, okay? You spend time now with your dream. And now everybody, take a moment to feel the soles of your feet and the crown of your head and see how much of your body you can feel at the same time. All right, Jessica, can you please tell the dream in the present tense as if it were happening right now? Mm -hmm. And go slow, okay? That's easiest for us and for you. I'm uh, submerged in water. I see clear blue water all around me. I see people's legs and bodies, um, but their heads are above the water and my head is below the water. And I'm swimming around um, and I start to feel panicked. And I swim away from them. Somehow I don't see anyone anymore and I'm trying to find the top of the water and I'm swimming up for a little while and finally I reach the top and there is glass and I'm trying to push the glass and I'm trying to get out and I'm really scared um, and it takes a while but I'm able to push the glass and then I wake up. Um. 
what I will do now is I'll just give you my reactions, which I might not do in psychotherapy. It's just for um, for everybody here. Um, so um, I feel um, uh, when you begin to get into the fear, I can feel my body shrinking, and um, uh, the panic is uh, when you get under the glass and I had an experience when I was a child when I was under the ice so I can feel that feeling. Mm -hmm. There's a horrible feeling that I feel and then when you push it up I feel this experience in my body. So that is something that happens to me. I don't know if I am in tune, whatever, but this is what I'm feeling. So for a moment everybody feel what you were feeling as you heard the dream. And Jessica, can you please tell the dream again? Same way. It was beautiful. Very good. I'm submerged in water. I see clear blue water all around me. And I'm just swimming around. I see people's bodies, their legs. Um, I'm just kind of swimming through. Their heads appear to be above the water while I'm under the water. Um, and then I'm swimming and trying to find the top of the water and I don't see the people anymore. And uh, it takes me a while to get to the top. And I reach the top and touch the top and there's glass there. And I try to push through and I can't. And eventually I push it. Yeah. Push have you ever had, um, I'll, I'll just ask very few um, associations, okay? We're not going to go into too personal. Have you ever had an experience like this in your waking life? No. Okay. Um, because then it would be different. So, um, uh, now, um, when I say time out, uh, I'm speaking to everybody, okay? okay. Time out. Um, so, you don't have to work a dream along the narrative. If I would work along the narrative, we would get into the panic right away and we would get into a tension and we wouldn't be able to get in. So I'm going to start at the end of the dream, this moment of lifting, so that we get into uh, that sense of the safety that is there. Then I am going to the moment of the panic just before and then in the end I want to move perspective away from Jessica to the people who have their heads above the water and below the water. So, um, uh, and maybe I will make, uh, do it a little different that I will work with that first before I get to the panic. I want to end up with the moment of pushing it up and the fear of not being able to push it up. So I'm, I'm chopping up the narrative. Um, so can you go to the moment where it just, the glass begins to lift? Um, uh, you're underwater? Yes. And um, you're using both hands? Yes. Uh -huh. At first it was one. And then okay, both. so go to at first. Mm -hmm. Can you sense this one hand and can you go to the first moment where you feel it budge? Like feeling it move? Yeah. Um, it doesn't move until both hands. Yeah, so go to both hands then. Uh -huh. So sense it with both hands and feel it in your body, sense your body as it begins to move with both hands. Can you feel the effort that it takes? Yes. Sense your body in the water and feel the effort that it takes. Where in your body does that effort begin? It begins feel in my stomach. Yeah. So focus on your stomach and feel how from the stomach up into your hands this effort happens. Mm -hmm. As you push up the glass, is the glass cold or warm? I don't feel no, the temperature feel of it. Okay, mm -hmm. so keep sensing it in the stomach mm -hmm. and now begin to sense 
what happens in the stomach that makes it possible for you to create enough force to push up the glass? What is happening in the stomach? Tightening and fear. Mm -hmm. So feel the tightening and fear. Mm -hmm. And feel in the tightening and fear the strength that moves up through your body, your arms and your hands. Can you feel that? Yes. So what is it like that out of the tightening and fear, this strength emerges that makes it possible to lift? I'm still scared. Mm -hmm. um, and yet I feel like I'm free at the same yeah. time. So feel that combination of scared and free, the force that comes up from the stomach, the force that comes in the hands that lifts it up, and that combination of scared and free, and feel that in the stomach. Can you feel that? Stay with that for a moment. Just feel it. So now we go backwards. And can you go to the moment where you're swimming underwater? Do you know where up is? Yes. Uh huh. Are you very deep underwater? I don't get a sense of how deep it is, yeah. but um, I'm submerged, yeah. so and I, I don't feel the floor. Floor. Yeah. Can you breathe, or is there no? Is that not an issue? I can't breathe. You cannot breathe. Mm -hmm. So you're holding your breath. Mm -hmm. Can you sense how you're holding your breath? What is it like in your body to be holding your breath? and trying to get to the surface. Just do it briefly, don't do this too long, okay? Yeah. What is it like to be holding your breath and trying to get to the surface and that sense of panic that you have? Where in your body can you feel that most? I feel it in my stomach. Yeah. And as you um, as you are feeling it in your stomach, can you sense how you're holding your breath? Do you feel that anywhere else else than in your stomach? My head. Your head. Can you describe what is happening in your head? I feel like it. At first it doesn't feel this way, but it feels like it's gonna pop. Yeah, so feel in your head just for a moment. Don't do it too long. Mm -hmm. Feel how your head is gonna pop. Okay. Now since we're going way to the beginning of the dream. Time out, I'm working this very fast, as you can see. Um, but we don't have much time. So um, can you now go to the beginning of the dream, how you're submerged and you see the other people. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the other people? Um, I think they might be family members, but I don't know. Uh -huh. uh, what do you actually see? I have a see? sense of knowing them, but ah. not really. I just see their legs. Yeah. Focus mm -hmm. on your sense of knowing them. And can you now focus on their legs? Are their legs standing or are they also floating? Floating. And can you notice how their heads are above the water? Not really. I'm so low that I can hardly see their heads. Uh huh. So what? do you notice in them? You notice are, there, are they connected to each other or what do you notice about them as you are deep underwater? That they're kind of grouped together. Yeah. Can you focus on their grouped 
together nature? And can you begin to let your awareness be attracted to that group that is together, that is closer to the surface? Can you sense their group connection? Focus on their connection as a group and see if you can sense their connection. They're like family, they're connected. Mm -hmm. Can you sense that connection and feel what it is like, that connection? Can you describe the connection that they have? They're having a nice time. Mm -hmm. Laughing, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, talking, socializing. Socializing. Mm -hmm. And can you feel the quality of their connection? Yes. What does it feel like, that quality of connection? Warm. Warm. Mm -hmm. Sense the warmth of the quality of their connection. Can you feel that? Yes. So stay with the warmth of the quality of their connection. Just feel it with your body, mm -hmm. that warmth. Stay with it. Feel the warmth of the quality of their connection. Time out. So now we have three states. And now I'm going to help her to feel these three states simultaneously, because that's the dream. So can you focus on the warmth of their connection? Feel that they're talking, they're laughing, they're together. Mm -hmm. Their togetherness is warm, and you can feel that where in your body? Um, feel it in my chest, like my heart. Like your heart. Light S yeah. feeling. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a light feeling in the heart. So stay with that light feeling in the heart, that warmth of connectedness of people that might be family, mm -hmm. that are laughing together in the heart. Sense that. Now go back to the moment that you're swimming underwater mm -hmm. and that your head might pop. Feel that with your head. And then in your stomach, feel that force of combination of freedom and fear that comes up that gives you the strength to lift up, lift up the glass to freedom. In the stomach, that force of fear mm -hmm. and freedom that makes it possible for you to lift up the glass. The head that is about to pop with panic underwater, holding your breath, and in the heart, that warmth of connection, of laughter, of family, togetherness, lightness in the warm heart, the head popping with panic of being underwater, trying to get up, and the ability, the force, in the stomach that is a combination between fear and freedom that makes the hand strong enough to push up the glass. Can you feel all of that? Now stay with that. The warmth in the heart of family, of connection, the popping panic in the head of trying to get up, and the stomach full of fear and freedom as the force moves to the hands, being able to lift it up so that you can get out. Stay with that for two minutes. Keep feeling it. The stomach, the popping head, and the warm, light heart of family. warm, 
light heart, the panic popping head, the force in the stomach. One more minute. The warm, light heart of connectedness. The panic popping head. And the force in the stomach going up pushing up to freedom. As you feel all this, can you describe what is happening in your body? My hands feel really tense. My hands feel really tense. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm furrowing my eyebrows, but I'm not yeah. really sure if I'm doing that. Yeah. Um, I can breathe easier. Yeah. Are there emotions? The frowning of the eyebrows, the easier breathing, the tension in the hands. Are there any emotions? Yes, it's it's mixed. Um, Mist? Mixed. Mixed, yeah. Feel the mixture of emotions. Sense that mixture. Feel what it is like to be in that mixture of emotions. And can you describe that mixture of emotions? There's still fear uh, and hope. Uh -huh. Fear and hope. Feel that mixture of fear and hope. And feel what that does to you as you also feel the popping panic in the head, the heart of connection, and the stomach of the force to, towards freedom with fear. That mixture of fear and hope. What is it like to be inside this mixture? It's a little uncomfortable, but it's not intolerable. Mm -hmm. um, It's almost easier to feel the fear than the hope, so huh. um, mm. I think that's the hard part. Yeah, that it's easier to feel the fear than the hope. Mm. Mm. Yeah. We'll go on one more minute, just keep feeling it, and then we'll stop. Sense your head, your heart, your stomach, the fear and the hope. Are there still words that you want to say? The longer I sit with it, the easier it is. The longer I sit with it, the easier it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you want another minute to sit with it? Just sit with it for another minute, okay? Mm -hmm. The longer I sit with it, the easier it is. Well, I want to thank you so much Thank you so much. Thank That's you. really. Um, do you mind mm -hmm. if if people want to ask you questions? Is that would that be okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just sit here for a moment. Okay.
Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. That's very gutsy to do that in front of your fellow <laughs> students and everything. So thank you. So any um, responses or questions that you may have about what it was like for her, questions about the work. So um, I don't want her to be sitting here too long. So maybe first things that you want to say to her. Yeah. I felt very moved for the whole time, but especially toward the end when you named that it was easier to feel here than home. Mm -hmm. And that the longer that you sat with it, the easier it became. I felt <coughs> that in my own heart. I felt so lifting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, could you say that once more a little bit louder? Yes. I'll face you again and tell you that I, I was so moved by the whole experience of being able to be with you in it. And the moment when you spoke that it was easier to feel fear than hope. I know this place. And I was moved. And then when you said that the longer you sat with it, it was easier to feel the hope. Mm -hmm. No, 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 easier to feel it. Easier to feel it. Yeah. yeah. To stay in it. To feel it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what Let's not get optimistic here. Is that <laughs> my heart started to just feel a little uh, more you know, light? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that felt good to my heart. Mm -hmm. so I was appreciating the, um, the bravery for you to share. Yeah. But at the beginning, I, I found myself. In the first telling, my, I could really feel myself holding my breath. Mm -hmm. And then as the work went on, it sort of moved down my body. And now I felt at the end this tension in my legs, yeah. which is still there, but I can feel myself breathing so much easier. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious if that mirrors at all your experience of. of yeah, my right leg is really tense, actually. Uh -huh. Yeah. I was holding it, and I noticed that afterward that yeah. I was kind of clenching my, <laughs> I don't know if you can clench your leg, yeah. but uh, yeah, I feel tension in the right leg. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's why it's very important to not um, uh, go into hope. It's that mixture that is very tense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was very glad that there was a feeling of connection that started to come between in the group. Mm -hmm. And um, because I felt very lonely in that swimming away. And then I, when I felt that connection in the group, I felt that relief was beginning to settle in. So that. Yeah, it was interesting to embody the feeling of the group. Yeah. Because um, at first I wasn't focused on that at all. No, yeah. no. And so um, the reason why, uh, why we do this, because the they are there in the dream. They are part mm -hmm. of the dreaming. Mm -hmm. So you can acce access them as a, as a group, and that frequently brings up emotions that you were not aware of at all while dreaming, because you're so identified with the one who's swimming by herself all alone mm -hmm. and can't breathe and right. can't get up. And mm -hmm. So, yeah. I'm glad they're there. Me too. Yeah? <coughs> I was wondering whether you had any temptation to ask about details about the group that was swimming around uh, and not sort of panic about the condition that the group that was able to breathe. Yeah, that was the group we were talking about. And so, um, um, right, that was, mm -hmm. the, yeah. And so the only thing that um, was seen of that were the legs, right? Because you were from deep down. So the risk of beginning to ask too many questions about that is that you get into fabrication. The enemy of imagination is fabrication. The moment that she starts to fabricate, we lose the imagination. So we have to stay within the data that we have. And the data that we have is that you could see from below, you could see those legs. So that's all you can do. And then you can focus on the, uh, those legs and see if from there something begins to happen. And then that cohesion in the group began to self-manifest. 
And that self-manifestation, that then begins to create change. If you do fabrication, fabrication is powerless. It doesn't do anything. So therefore, I have to be really careful to not ask too many questions when she tells me that it is vague, that only mm -hmm. the legs, but what was clear was the sense of cohesion mm -hmm. of the group. And so that's why we could go there. Yeah, one, two. Um, I felt myself being really curious about you. Um, when you first told the dream mm -hmm. and we were not logically thinking about the content, I just mm -hmm. really felt a strong reaction to the color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I felt like we didn't really get back to that, and that was sort of hanging there for me. Yeah. But I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. No, mm -hmm. that's very good. Um, you have to see, of course, that I was almost rushing through it. I was going really fast. Um, but that's a very good point. And I'm very glad that you, that you, so when you work, you begin to ask questions about that blue. And the questions that you ask is, what kind of blue is that? Can you say more about the blue? Does it have a feeling? Does it have a feeling tone? Mm -hmm. And then you go into the blue and you help her to get drawn into the blue. And the blue, I mean, the, the, their dark blue is very different from light blue. And you get very different atmospheres. <laughs> so then you can be pulled into those atmospheres that are part of the dreaming. And you will get an aspect that we didn't get to now that is really important. So that was really good. Yeah? I, I had a question about the temperature, Jessica. So mm -hmm. in the beginning, you were having trouble have, giving us the temperature of the glass. But at some point, as you were talking about the room, mm -hmm. you, you said it felt warm. Um, yeah, just the yeah. group felt warm in that they felt connected. Yeah. So that was a warm as metaphor, whether the, uh, the, the uh, temperature of the glass was a literal question. So I think that the warmth was a, a, a metaphorical like statement. Relational warmth. A relational warmth, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned that um, fabrication was the enemy of imagination. Yeah, and that now we're counterintuitive. Yeah, let's, l let me talk about that f uh, for a moment. But um, I think that uh, we are holding you up here. So thank you very, very much. Yeah. And we're going on with that question. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Good question. I, I I, before you answer that, I also want to say that I think this dream gives new meaning to pushing through the glass ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is very true. So um, the, that question of um, um, imagination and fabrication. Um, imagination comes to you. Imagination, the agency of imagination is um, from the comes from the images. That's why we call it imagination. Um, so uh, when um, when she says there there is connection and warmth that comes from the image, as she focuses on it, it begins to she begins to sense the warmth. So it comes goes through sensing. She senses the warmth. She senses the connection, and she begins to feel it with her heart. So that is imagination because it comes from the image. Fabrication is we're trying to make sense of it. We're trying to understand what's going on. Um, it's all um, a fabrication is basically thoughts in drag. Um, uh, it's a, the, the, the first person to talk about that is Plotinus, um, uh, the Neoplatonist, who talks about that um, he doesn't call it fabrication, but something that we would call fabrication, is actually uh, thoughts that parade as images. Mm -hmm. So we're no longer with fabrication. You're no longer in imagination, but you're in the mind. And this goes from the perspective that the imagination is a world unto itself. And that as you slow the process down, you get deeper into the imagination, and um, it becomes more and more distinct from um, mental. And we can talk about that more, because that's really important. So thank you very much for bringing that up. Yeah, I mean, uh, do you want to say something about uh, the whole sense of the intelligence of the imagination yeah. versus the uh, sort of yeah. the awareness of the ego? Yeah. Um, this work. Um, 
has its um, its basis um, like about 2,000 years ago this kind of work began. It had its height around the 12th century when the visionary culture, the visionary tradition was very powerful. Um, and um, it was in Andalusia. It was in the, in the uh, Iberic Peninsula. It was the time, uh, one of the high points of Western culture where um, where Muslim culture and Jewish culture and Christian culture was working together. And at that point, there was, um, there was a struggle between um, what would be called the Neoplatonist tradition where imagination <coughs> is a form of reality and where there are three realities. There's the reality of mind, which we now work as mind, mathematics, um, spirit, um, it's what's called the intelligible. It has no form, and that's why you can only describe it mathematically. Um, and then there's matter, and um, the Aristotelians would say there's two worlds. There's the world of mind and matter, and that's where we got that conundrum of mind and matter, and what is it? Is it mind or is it matter? But at that time, imagination was a third reality. Imagination was seen to be entirely real and had body and had intelligence of its own. And then you see 800 years of, a of development in Western culture where imagination becomes the opposite of reality. So if there's a 180 degree turn in our understanding of the imagination. So I'm going back to that old understanding of imagination as a form of reality with its own intelligence. So we, you can access intelligence through the intelligible, through the mind. Uh, you can access it through experiment, through the physical. And you can access intelligence through imagination. Mm -hmm. And so we need a discipline of imagination. That's what William James was talking about, right? William James was saying that we have to develop an, um, a, a, a science of the interior, a science of subjectivity, of imagination, that is just as rigorous as the science that we now have of the exterior of the exterior world. Mm -hmm. So this is the right place to talk about it. Yeah. So in the valuing of that imagination in that work on that particular dream, on Jessica's dream, was there a moment in the work, if you had more time? where you would have gone to get a different perspective, for example, in, uh, in the group of people who were swimming, to look back at the Jessica in the dream. That, I think, would have led to fabrication. There was, there was so little information that we actually had, right, Jessica? There was so little information that we actually had that to put too much weight on that information, you get into fabrication. Then the other thing you have to see, that as I'm doing this work, I am in a panic, too because I know nothing and I think, oh my God, why I'm doing this, right? Um, I have no idea what's going on, Ugh. And so my mind doesn't function really as well as it does now. And um, so um, that's why I didn't go into the blue. I, I, I just lost that. Yeah. And um, so you are, the uncertainty, the uncertainty of being in that imagination and being in the interpersonal field. Mm -hmm. Uncertainty is part of the nature of the interpersonal field, of the mm -hmm. relational field. Um, well, could I stop you there for a yeah. second? So, because I think for all <laughs> of us, you know, for all of us, this is a good question about how do we develop that ability to tolerate that uncertainty? Yeah. Um, that um, comes from Keats, from a letter that he wrote where he calls it negative capability. He never worked it out what it is, but the word is beautiful. Negative capability. We have to develop negative capability. The ability to be in the unknown without freaking out to the point, really freaking out, I was freaking out, but without freaking out to the point that you can't do anything anymore and without being forced into interpretation because interpretation gets rid of the negative, uh, gets rid of the unknown. So the negative capability is the ability to stay in the unknown. And, and so in working with Jessica and the panic, you were also feeling some of the panic. Oh yeah. And so the sharing of that affective state, maybe you could speak a little bit about the value of that. Yeah. Um, 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 as I share this state, 
because I, I felt, I, I, as I said in the beginning, I had the same thing. I, I fell through a hole in the, I'm Dutch. I fell through a hole in the ice. I was under the ice, I was pushing up. I remember that. It was a horrible, horrible, horrible moment. So I was very much in that, which gives us existential proximity because we are now in intimacy because we know what we're going through together. Her experience, Jessica's experience, has pulled in my experience. So we're in it together now. And if I would at this moment go to the point that I know what I'm doing, I know what's going on, I am the one who is the authority, all those kind of things would immediately destroy it. It would destroy the intimacy. So um, I have to allow um, the same panic to be there. And the only difference is that um, I have been in this panic many, many times and I've been doing it for a while. And um, so the panic doesn't impede my ability to still ask questions. So you're not overwhelmed by the panic. I'm not overwhelmed by the panic, even though the panic is by itself overwhelming. So I'm in a, in a state of, and this is also William James, I'm in a state of dual consciousness where at the same time I'm aware that I'm in a panic and I'm in a panic. That changes the panic mm -hmm. because uh, there is a meta-consciousness going on simultaneously with the panic. And, and what does that do for the person whose dream, whose dream that you're working on? What is that, your dual consciousness, how does that help them or in terms of the work itself? Well, um, because it allows me to be in negative capability so that I don't know what's going on just as much as Jessica doesn't know what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, but that uh, um, if I would start panicking and only be in the state of panic, I'm no longer help to her. Yeah. So, um, but if I move away from my panic to be in some kind of an understanding, benevolent therapist, whatever, then I'm also not close to her. So I, uh, of use to her. You're abandoning her. So I'm abandoning her, exactly. And um, so um, it's very important for the person you work with that you can stand the unknown, that you can stand this panic of dealing with the unknown, that you can stand the panic of not breathing, and um, at the same time uh, be aware that you still have to do something. Yeah, and you can hold that. You can tension. hold that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about you know, the anchoring process. Yeah. Because you anchored these three states in her body. Yes. And I think it would be really helpful for everyone to really understand the intention of that and yeah. the value of that. Yes. I'll explain that and then have questions about yeah. that because that's a very important point. Um, it is very difficult to feel multiple emotions at the same time. Um, um, emotions uh, like that, uh, they're, they're like music. They, they, they come sequentially. Um, and um, uh, as we as we anchor them in the body, for instance, the panic in the popping of the head, then by triggering the popping head, the whole state of panic will be there. Um, but um, I, um, as I can also then trigger the power that is in the belly that, that makes it possible through the fear to push up to freedom, that that power is there, that she has that ability and that she knows that she has that ability so that she can feel the popping in the head and the power that is right here that is mediated by the warmth in the heart and the sense of connection and that is different from the lonely swimming through the blue and being out in the blue all by yourself. Um, and if she can hold these th three states by triggering these points, these, the, the head, the belly, and the heart, um, then um, we are in a mul multiplicity of consciousness. And the dream is, the imagination is multiple. The, the consciousness is distributed. It is not only in, um, in the... Um, in habitual consciousness is distributed over the entire dream. That's the notion that the whole dream is intelligent. There's intelligence everywhere and you can identify, we're just identified with self. We've learned from, from year one that this is me and this is my subjectivity. But that's something that we learned. Um, so um, 
in order to feel this multiple, these multiple subjectivities simultaneously, you have to anchor them in the head, and, uh, anchor them in the body, in the head, in the stomach, and the heart, um, which is a trick that comes from Stanislavski, that comes from acting. Um, in um, an actor um, uh, um, feels an entire, like for instance, if an actor has to um, uh, start shivering. Uh, on stage and you're in these hot lights and you have to start shivering. You can do it in two ways. You can do the English method um, that is um, that you begin to shiver and then the emotion will come from that or you can do the Russian method that was misunderstood into the method of the American actors which had nothing to do with Stanislavski and he said what the hell are you doing but it was already happening. Um, uh, where you start with a moment that you were ice cold and you felt your your ears freezing. You put your, all your attention in your frozen ears and then you begin to shiver from there. So it's a sense memory, mm -hmm. right? And so I have now located three sense memories in the body and I trigger them simultaneously and thereby multiple states can exist simultaneously. And then you sort of chant them in a composite over and over. I chant them over. in a composite so that, so that they can be held at the same time, so that in the end Jessica can feel, in the end, that she can contain them. Yeah. And that's uh, my, uh, my analyst and teacher, James Hillman, what he says, that he calls soul making. You expand the soul so that it can contain, that it can contain all these um, opposing forces and these different forces and that actually is the beginning of all of psychoanalysis. Freud already did that because you want to to feel things without having to either act them out or to repress them and that is the ability of the analytical moment where you can hold them at the same time so that's basically what I'm trying to do and that's why I'm very much in a psychoanalytic tradition but let's ask yeah Yeah. Um, so the dreamer is the dreamer. If, if you stay, I understood that it's very important that you stay exclusively with the material that the dreamer has verbalized to you and expressed to you, because otherwise you're going to leap towards fabrication, and that's not the dream. Correct. And you're going to lose the access of the dreamer to her own imagination. Yes. Now. The dreamer itself, herself, itself. For example, when I closed my eyes and I was looking at the legs of the group of people, I I could not resist but trying to go with my imagination to the top of the water and see who they were. Yeah. Now you, as the person who would guide, would come back so that there is no fabrication going to see which heads they are there. Right. But it's very. It's tempting, tempting for the for the dreamer itself because in that way yeah. it's like you can be even I thought that I was surprised to see which people how, how did the people look yeah and I felt like I learned from that yeah um, yes uh, that's a very important uh, thing that you bring up I stay entirely with the data that I get and the data that I get is just these legs hanging there. Um, I don't trust the habitual consciousness for as far as I can throw it. I don't trust this, this force that goes up and looks at the people. I don't trust it at all. Um, uh, I think that it will make up things and we lose the data that we have and we get into a made up world that may be very interesting but no longer is related to the dream. So I, uh, and the way that I resist the temptation is by slowing things down. Because what happens is that imagination goes very fast. And as we slow it down and stay just with what is, um, this, f this desire to move to the surface will go away because you just begin to focus on those legs. What are they like? What can you see? Um, are they moving? Are they still? Are they standing? Are they hanging? All those kind of questions makes it slow down and I'm totally uninterested in who they are. The only thing that I know is that it's a bunch of legs and then she says, oh, it may be family. So then I begin to sense, oh, there may be family. So let's now go and sense the connection because family, there are family connections maybe. So is, are there connections? And then she says, yes, there's connections. And then from there we begin to go on. 
but I don't trust it a bit. This is the difference between my work and Jung's work. Jung says you dream the dream onwards. I say no, you stay entirely in the given. Because if you dream the dream onwards, you get into making things up and you lose the efficiency and the efficacy of the dream. Well, I just noticed that you asked her if she had any information about the faces, and yeah. she said no. Right, so and that's I, what I take. Yeah. Yes, and so I, you actually got from her that there was no information. About right, her. but then you can still do what, what you are saying is, OK, let's shift the perspective to above the water, and let's look. But that I don't trust. Yeah. There, I don't want to go. So, I, can I ask another Yeah, question? please. I, um, I was really so struck and moved by the, per the perspective of the group of people. Right. So that felt new and yeah. really cool. Yeah. Um, but how, how did you choose to not go with the sense of separateness or loneliness? Mm -hmm. Was that just a matter of because you were going so fast in the um, stream? Or uh, because it didn't come up from her. Um, it was something that I felt, mm -hmm. and um, I could have asked it, but she had enough to deal with, uh, with the panic and with not being able to breathe underwater. It feels entirely secondary. Loneliness feels completely secondary when you're underwater and you're trying to, to get to the top of the water. You're not thinking about loneliness. It's not the first thing on your mind. So I'm trying to stay what is foremost important to her. And I have that feeling at the same time of there is loneliness of being separate to, uh, to the group, but I am in that knowledge with a state of absolute uncertainty. I don't know if this is my feeling or if it's her feeling, and I would have to check that out. And at the moment, I first I will hold that sense of loneliness in absolute uncertainty. Um, wait, <laughs> Let, if you don't mind, I'll uh, have Jill go first. Jill is my oldest collaborator. We've been collaborating for 30 years, and I'm very glad that you're here. Okay. I, I do remember, and I may be wrong, so if you remember, you can correct me, but there was a moment when she said, I'm feeling alone. She feels alone before she sees the, the figures, and I was thinking about that, too, that that, to me, was a, a really important place where she goes from feeling completely alone under the water and then all of a sudden sees the legs. Yeah. So I, I don't know if that's what you're referring um, to. Uh, Jessica, um, was that something that you actually were noticing, that aloneness? Interesting. I don't remember saying that. Before. Yeah, I don't remember it either. But there definitely was a sense of being alone in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, so, <laughs> so that's, where, that's where we were both drawn in. See, because I'm sitting with her, you're sitting at a distance, yeah. and so you can see it. I, we are in this space together, and I am, we are both not breathing, and we are both trying to get to the surface, and uh, we are both suffocating. And then the question of being alone becomes less important. Not that you should ask, yeah, yeah. Just, there was just that moment. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree, I agree. Yeah? Um, I'm curious, you, uh, it's kind of going off that, but with staying with the data you're given, how much of that data was in your own embodied state? Because I'm wondering if that, how much of that was your guide? I'm interested in it as like a co-created process. Yes, it, it's an entirely co-created process. Yeah. If Jill else. would work it, she right. would work it differently. So, and it would be a different piece of work. And you had such a strong and immediate connection to the panic under the ice. Yeah. So I'm wondering how figural that became at, in this. It you became. You talk about that as yeah. your embodied states as. Yeah. So this is unusual, right? It, it, I do not every time get that I know this state because I've experienced it in my history as a little Dutch boy under the ice. And so it immediately gets pulled in, which is an incredible advantage in the work. So that doesn't happen usually. So usually I do not have that much of my own state to work with. But I, I would feel, even if I hadn't had a, that experience, I would feel what it is like to not breathe. That's why I asked, 
can you breathe, is breathing, does breathing matter? Because in dreaming, frequently people are underwater and dreaming doesn't matter. So you have to ask that question. And then, because I was feeling it in my lungs, and, but I have to know if that what I'm feeling in my lungs actually is just my experience or is it her experience as well, because um, uh, there's something that Hillman calls the naturalistic fallacy, is to expect that the uh, imagination will behave the same way as nature behaves. And you can never assume that. Even though it looks alike, it behaves very differently. So I have to ask that. But the moment that she said, breathing, I can't breathe, and um, then I had to move her away from the stomach, and the, that's another thing, right? I had to move her away from the stomach because we had anchored the, um, the fear, freedom element that becomes the force that makes it possible to push up. We had anchored that in the stomach. You don't want to anchor two things in the same place. So then I began to ask, where else can you feel it? And then it was the popping head. Um, uh, but it is a co-creation. It, it happens in a relational field. Um, so all the laws of relational psychoanal uh, psychoanalysis pertain. Um, and um, uh, the only thing in the co-creation that I have to be really, really careful about is that I don't lead her. I have to be not behind her, not in front of her, but next to her. And we have to be there together. Yeah? So in that sense, are you not using data from your own body? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay. But then I ask questions like, I couldn't breathe. And so I'm asking Jessica, is, does breathing matter at this point? So I'm asking that question from Came my... From it comes from my embodied state of, of that I just am not able to breathe. This, I'm suffocated. But I have to know, is this just happening to me? Am I back in my childhood memory? So I have to always check it. It's always uncertain. One, two, three, yeah. Do you have a limit to the number of embodied like, yeah. states you would try and help someone hold at one yeah. time? Yeah. Um, um, uh, coming from Jung, we started with two states. Jung is a polarity thinker, and Jung thinks in opposites. Um, and um, then I began to feel it very inadequate, and people began to present more states. And I found multiplicity of states much more interesting. And um, so then I went into multiple states. And in the 90s, we went haywire, and we had people do eight, nine, 10 states, uh, especially when I started to work with actors who are really good at it. And I worked with really great, uh, some of the great actors. And they could do it really well. But the interesting thing is, if you have too many states, then it erodes back to two states. Hmm. So therefore, um, we've now found that if you do three, four, five maximum states, um, uh, you can still contain that, you can still hold that, and it still works. Beyond that, it either becomes chaos or it erodes. Yeah. Are you behind? Yeah? Yeah. Um, this may be a silly question, but why did you start? There are no silly questions. Why did you start at the end of the dream? Yeah. Um, I do not want to, um, to immediately be in the panic um, because... The, the densest place in the Yeah, dream. the densest place. I don't want to start there. Um, I want to get there, but I don't want to start there. So um, I am taking the moment of the relief to enter so that also it has two advantages. In the first place is you don't start from a place of dense panic. And the other thing is, if the panic gets too great, you have a place to go back to that she can feel the relief. So you have, in the pressure cooker, you have this thing that you can turn up. Um, the narrative, I think, is um, less important than the image. Um, I think frequently the narrative is a mnemonic device, the way you remember something. Um, uh, I'm interested uh, particularly in the image and uh, to go as deeply into the image as possible and the most threatening part of the image is being deep underwater not being able to breathe and I had the feeling and that's why I asked but that I was wrong 
I had the feeling at that moment, because that happened to me, that I didn't know what was up and down. And that was the most frightening moment for me when I was under the ice, but you didn't have that. So that's what I have to check then. So um, I was anticipating that maybe I would be in a moment where you're underwater, you don't know where, where is up and where is down. It's one of the most scary things that you can imagine. So I did not want to get there too quickly. The other thing is that as you, that with every dream or memory that you work, because you do, can do this with memories as well, you could do the same work with me as a child remembering being under the ice. You could do the same piece of work. Um, uh, as you uh, are, um, oh, I get completely distracted. I suddenly saw that event happening again. Mm -hmm. Oof. Um, so uh, you're, where were we? <laughs> uh, so, uh, just, can you uh, cue me again? You were saying, why did you start at the end of the day? Yes, um, thank you. Um, um, so um, uh, I um, want to have that moment of the ability to lift, because that's, there is a, an ability to lift. Where does that come from in the body? because there is an ability to get out of this. And so I want Jessica to feel that that ability is present. I would have worked it very differently if the dream had ended before she pushed herself out. But there is something in those two hands that has that ability. So that's ability to free herself. That's the place where I want to start. So before you go to those two questions there, let's jump in here about, so you had a, a memory you say you could work from memory. Yeah. So talk a little bit about this idea of that you don't need to work on a dream, that you can work from a narrative or a memory. Mm -hmm. Because many people here don't necessarily have patients who dream. So right. talk a little bit about that. Okay. Let me talk about my memory. And um, of course it's uh, um, who has himself for a doctor has a fool for a doctor, but let me just... <laughs> um, uh, so um, um, I am... I think I'm, I think I must have been seven years old, um, and so what I would do is I would ask me. So I would ask Robbie, um, uh, "Can you describe where you are?" Well, we're we're on a canal behind the house, and um, the ice is nice and thick, and we are. Um, we are walking on it, we're playing on the ice, we're skating, we're having a lot of fun. So then I go into the body of the one who's skating and who's having a lot of fun, and then um, I fall through the ice and I'm under the ice, and so then I would first wo work the end, which is a big brother of a friend who comes running out, and then I would help me identify with this big brother who then pulls me out. And then I would go to that moment under the ice where I don't know what's up and down. That's the most terrifying moment. But then I always have this, this big brother who can pull me out. And you so would anchor that in, your, in the body too? All these things I would anchor. I would yeah. anchor the one who has fun riding and this wonderful um, time in the winter when there was still ice, which uh, through the um, heat pollution, there's not much of that anymore. Um, uh, and um, then the strength of the big boy who comes running out, I can see him, I know, and I could feel his arms pulling me up. So I would feel the arms, the strength in the arms, I would feel it in the arms, and the strength of the body that is pulling me up. And then I would go to the panic of being under the ice and not knowing what's up or down, and that moment of not knowing what's up and down, and that feeling of, and, and when you get in that feeling, I would anchor that, and then I would have three places that I would work. So you can do it with a memory just as well. Yeah. And you can do it with a memory from yesterday. It doesn't have to be a childhood memory. Yeah, somebody there? Oh, I've, I uh, by the way, only been looking to that side, so if there are people from that side <laughs> who want to, yeah. Mm -hmm. When you're sitting there with your eyes closed and you're next to the person who's telling the dream, are you imagining yourself into the dream next to are you trying to take on the role of the dreamer, or are you watching from a distance? Where are you? I am in the image, um, and I squint. I don't have my eyes closed only. So I want to have it dark, 
And so I squint and I see her uh, enough. Um, and then sometimes I have my eyes entirely closed. But I am with her in the image. I am with her in the water. I am with her in that environment as much as I can. I can never be in it the way Jessica is in it because she was there and I wasn't. So she's the pilot, I'm the co-pilot. And so I'm, I'm next to her with it. She is the expert on the image, I am not. I am the expert on the method, she's the expert on the image. And so I am um, with her as much in the image as I can. I think there's another question. Right yeah. There. Um, you mentioned that you can work. Both yeah. Can you dreams. point to the question? Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that you can work with both dreams and memories. Yeah. Similarly. Yeah. How do you differentiate between, um, or if there is a differentiation, if the uh, dream is a memory, is there a a difference in working with the dream as a memory? Mm. Like what I said before, did you have that experience? Yeah, and you said in, that it would have been different. Yeah. Um, uh, even if a dream um, is based on a memory, it's still going to be different. So I would ask her about that memory, and she will describe that memory to her, and I would focus very much on how the dream is different from the memory, because that's where the dream is doing its most activity. Um, we know from uh, trauma research with dreaming that um, uh, Ernest Hartman and Alan Siegel did research on that. Um, uh, there was a great fire in San Francisco and they followed the whole population who had lost their houses uh, with their dreams. And um, what they found was that at first people dreamed about the event, then people dreamt about other collective traumas like a flood or something, then they began to dream about personal traumas and then slowly it began to dissipate. So dreams by themselves, that's why Ernest Hartman, who was one of the great dream researchers of all time here, right here, he was in, um, at Tufts, he was professor of uh, psychiatry at Tufts, he's no longer with her, it's a great loss, with us, it's a great loss. Um, uh, he said that dreams are their own, uh, are our innate therapeutic system. Dreams digest trauma. And so when I see something different from the, from the historical reality in the dream, then I look there because I think that there um, the dream might be digesting something. Yeah? On that side. Yeah? Over there? Yeah. Um, I'm interested in what your next step would be after this. Like mm -hmm. oncoming sessions or the next yeah. day? Um, my... Uh, my next thing would be that I would say to Jessica now, um, practice this. Um, feel these three states in your body and do that like a few times, like the three, three times five minutes a day or three times three minutes a day. Feel that so that that expansion that is already happening, that expansion of being able to contain this will start happening. Um, then insights will come during the week. Um, I have no idea, I'm not going to venture what these insights might be. They might be about family, they might be about uh, being out in the blue, they might be about being alone, they might be about the body, whatever, it might be about the way of walking, you never know what it's going to be. So I would ask about that. Um, and then um, from that, associative patterns would come, um, things about the past would come in, um, so then you get into ordinary psychotherapy. Um, sometimes new dreams come up and you begin to work those dreams because dreams incubate each other, so that, that you get dreams that um, you can get whole series of dreams. That's why how we started to develop a way of working um, it, which we call brief and in-depth, which is eight or ten sessions where you start with um, an event and then you start dreaming about that and you follow the dreams over a series of eight to ten sessions and you begin to see how it begins to transform and by the end of that time something will have happened to the person. Um, we started doing that actually in China because in China 
um, long-term therapies. Uh, the government is afraid of that. They're afraid you're creating a cult. So um, the short-term therapies are very much, that's why cognitive behavioral therapy is so strong in China now. Uh, and we wanted to give an alternative because cognitive behavior is top down and we wanted to create, uh, to help them create a bottom up therapy that um, actually can be done in a brief period. And then we found out that it's pretty good here too because the insurances don't pay very much mm -hmm. for a long periods of time. So you can do something very useful in, in a brief amount of sessions. And that is because dreams begin to react to each other. And so then you begin to follow the dreams. With the image of the warmth of the family, the legs. Yeah. Warm. Yeah. And um, I was down with the dreamer looking up. Yeah. And I wonder if you might or I might or someone might ask the question, what is it like as the dreamer, what a, what is it like for you to um, witness the warmth of the yeah, that's how, that's, if you have more time, that's where you'd start. I usually start with what, that, I call that a reaction shot. I usually start with a reaction shot. I start with your response to that. But, yeah, and then, and then, so first the reaction of self, where you are already identified, and then uh, move to other, but we didn't have the time for that. We, I, I, I did a few shortcuts. Mm -hmm. That was a shortcut, so it's very good that you're bringing that in. That was a moment of a shortcut. Yeah. So the other day when you were talking, you, you said that um, you were picturing dreams as being part of the immune system. Yeah. And I, I'm just so interested in this idea of where healing actually happens. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, how you imagine this dreaming, the imagination as part of the immune system. Yeah. Um, for those of you who were here in the 80s, um, this and... Um, San Francisco were the great centers where research on AIDS was being done and so AIDS patients came from all over the world to Boston and to San Francisco but very much to Boston and so in the 80s before there were these uh, therapies uh, before even AZT uh, and very much before the cocktail AIDS was still a death sentence right and uh, many people younger people can't imagine that but it was in the 80s, it was a death sentence to have AIDS. Um, and um, as it still is in many places, slim in Africa, it's still a death sentence for many people. Um, uh, and there I began to work um, with many AIDS patients, and one of my books is Dreaming with an AIDS Patient, was about one of those pieces of work. And then I found that people um, lived marginally longer and not like like years longer but months longer than expected and so I began to wonder is there something that we're doing that is affecting the immune system because it's an immune disease and then I was very much um, uh, taken with um, uh, the great uh, other dream researcher from from Boston who was at Harvard Alan Hobson who um, uh, was working from the time where we still believed that all dreaming takes place during REM and now we know that that's not the case but REM is still the most efficient dream state 90% uh, dream reports whereas uh, sleep onset which is the second most has 70% dream reports um, and um, he found that actually REM sleep uh, because he studied cats REM sleep starts in uh, the pons in the pons and the brainstem. And the pons and the brainstem is also the location for the immune system and the heat regulation. And so then I began to say, well, if it's happening, if it's starting in the same place, might it be that um, there is a relationship between the immune system and dreaming? And, and I take as a hypothesis that, I, that has to be uh, demonstrated. Uh, it's just a hypothesis. It's not even a hypothesis. It's a pre-hypothesis. Um, <laughs> that uh, dreaming is part of the intelligence of the immune system because the immune system is unbelievably intelligent. It knows what is self and what is other. And um, uh, to me, it's a miracle that we don't die when we're born. 
I mean, we're, getting, we're born in a world that is full of bacteria, that is full of, of um, all kinds of pathogens, and we don't die. At least most of us don't, and let's pray that that will be an increasing fact. Um, and um, so to me, uh, the fact that people are healthy is the miracle. Um, uh, dream, uh, the, um, illness is not, uh, I'm, I'm not so much um, interested in what illness is, I'm, I'm interested in what's health. Because how do we stay healthy? How does the immune system know how to protect us? And I believe that dreaming actually is part of that intelligence of the immune system in protecting us and that we can stimulate that. Now, this is all completely talking from um, the other hole in my body. Um, but um, I do think that eventually it could be something that can be tested, and I think it would be very interesting to start testing it. And it also fits with Jung's idea about the psyche as a self-regulating system, yeah. right? That, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah, way yeah. it works yeah. that way. Just curious as to whether that process might be, if it were accurate, um, a cousin of visualization. Yes. Um, in the field part of it. Yes. Um, I think that... Um, uh, visual, the, there's a different visualization for some people is amazing. I have um, I have a friend who um, has an illness and she has a particular visualization and it's changed her life. Um, and she has a very good therapist who knows how to help her to those visualizations. My um, uh, my feeling is that it's even more potent if the image comes from the dreaming if it's not given by the therapist, if it actually comes from within the system and begins to come up, and I think that that is more potent. That's why we use it in the healing sanctuaries that we have, um, which are based on the ancient uh, healing sanctuaries in Greece and Turkey, um, where people, um, uh, by way of their dreaming, um, do all kinds of, uh, uh, next to all the other medicine that they're doing, by way of the dreaming, trigger those forces that help them move towards health. Because I think the body knows what health is. And then that same <clears throat> aspect, it might be that the therapist doesn't give the person the visual. Yeah. It might come from the person themselves to feel the embodiment of what might strengthen them or work for them or yeah. they, might, they might be able to. It was already given in Jessica's dream. The ability to push up mm. the ice, the ability towards freedom is given in the dream. And so to, um, uh, and but I would say practice that ability, but not just that, but also the panic um, and also the connection because if you practice them all together, um, it will be much more potent than if you only practice that ability to push it up because then it will start to affect the panic, it will start to affect your relationships, it will start to affect, uh, to affect your, your uh, connection to people, your loneliness, all the kind of things it begins to affect. So that's why I work with multiple states. But I, it's very similar to uh, imagery except that it comes from self. We have to move towards wrapping up, but if there's any questions that someone is sitting with that they're going to regret that they didn't ask, this is a great moment to do that. And is there any question that wants to be asked? Not that you want to ask, mm -hmm. but a question that wants to be asked. Nicely said. And where you channel that question. So maybe it is silence. Okay. Thank you, Robbie.